I think many of you know Rosina. She's a professor at the University of Michigan of Natural Resource, School of Natural Resources and Environmental Science and a foremost expert in this field. She served on President Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology as a lead author of the U.S. National Climate Assessment and was a review editor for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. There's probably no one more qualified than Rosina Birnbaum to give us this look at climate science. Rosina, over to you. Thank you. August group does clearly not need a climate change 101 primer. You all understand that climate change is happening. It's caused by humans. The impacts are already being felt and are accelerating. You know that we must seek to reduce emissions as much as possible and very, very rapidly to avoid getting into unmanageable territory. So can we put up the slides, please? Oops, well, there we go. Um, and we must uh, deal with the changes already underway and more to come. So we must avoid unmanageable levels of climate change and manage the unavoidable impacts that we are seeing right now. The science really has advanced in the last four years since I had a chance to brief you. And so I'm going to give you a science update and show you the evidence, including that the attribution of some extreme events to a changed climate can be made. So you well know that the Paris Agreement seeks to contain global temperature increases to two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. That's the non-roasted world on the left. But with Paris, we are still headed to the roasted world on the right, which is a world about four degrees Celsius warmer. But look at the additional change at the poles, where those changes are more like six degrees. But I want to say that at two degrees Celsius, the non-roasted world, it is still not a picnic. The coral reefs may all be gone. An additional billion people will experience water stress. And the worst impacts, of course, will be on the poor. So we need to adapt to the manifest changes that are already underway today at the one degree C temperature increase we've already seen. And most of the increase in disasters and extreme events that you can see on the chart on the left are weather related. So we've got to move from being reactive to proactive in our adaptation. We must really become more resilient and adapt to the unavoidable changes we are already seeing now. And the graph on the right shows you the kind of technology wedges we need roaring in by mid-century to get off that top line. And these wedges are different technologies that can help us bend the greenhouse gas curve. And we actually need to be on the bottom line headed towards zero. You might notice that the two largest wedges in that diagram, the top two red and orange, are energy efficiency and renewables. If you take all the science information about, sci about potential impacts and put it together in one gestalt picture, as I have here, um, you can see that our near-term risk, the red bar, is not insignificant. However, both the two-degree world, which I said was not roasted, and the four-degree world, the roasted world, get far more risky. However, Proactive adaptation can reduce that risk, and that's the gray bar that just appeared. Uh, and particularly, if we can stop at the two degrees C world, because adaptation becomes more costly and less effective as we head towards faster and greater change. So both the rate of change and the absolute magnitude of change are very important to help people respond we are already seeing rates of change that are many times faster than we can find in the very long-term paleo records of the planet. So we are essentially outside human ken of experience at the rate of changes today. The growth of carbon dioxide, which you all know is the most important greenhouse gas, has been inexorable. It's now at 408 parts per million. But as we went in and out of the ice ages over 650,000 years, it never approached that. It was between 150 and maybe 280 parts per million. And you cannot explain this increase by anything other than the, gross, the growth of carbon-based fuels. And here is the curve of energy use since the Industrial Revolution from the bottom up 
In brown, you have biomass, wood, and dung. Coal is gray, oil green, gas red, nuclear light blue, hydro dark blue, wind, solar, that tiny yellow sliver. So while that's the renewables, it is growing really rapidly, but the world is still heavily carbon-based and fossil fuel-based. But you are all changing that, and time is really of the essence. As this diagram shows, since the start of the Industrial Revolution, temperature change is accelerating, and we are already dangerously close to one and a half degrees C or two, de half, two degrees C above pre-industrial records. And here is the actual temperature record over that time, and you can see two things. The warming signal becomes very clear since 1970, and then the blue bars, which show you decade by decade, you can see each decade is warmer than the previous one starting in 1960. Here are the top 10 warmest years on record. Oops. Um, 2017 was the hottest year without an El Nino. We expect El Nino years to be warm, but it beat the warmest non-El Nino year by a very significant margin. How did the 2017 temperature play out across the planet? So we're now about 1.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is close to one degree Celsius above the pre-industrial levels. But look at, you can see that the Arctic was actually four to six degrees Fahrenheit, or if you think in Celsius, two to three degrees Celsius warmer. And the heating of the earth is ramping up the hydrological cycle. So you're seeing more precipitation total, but you are also increasing evaporation in the interior of continents. And this figure is actually from a recent climate change science report released by the Trump administration. You can see much drying that has occurred, but also much increasing rainfall over the earth. And, and that precipitation, which can be rain or it can be snow, is coming in more extreme events and causing infrastructure loss and a lot of human pain. The Arctic sea ice is continuing its dramatic decline. On the top, you see what it looked like in 1960, the surface area, and in the lower picture in 2012. The difference in that area is about the size of India. We expect an ice-free Arctic in the summer by 2030. Greenland is land-based ice, so when that melts, it contributes to sea level rise, um, and that is losing mass too. And in fact, the increase we have seen in sea level rise since 1970, which is about doubled from 1.7 millimeters a year to 3.4, we are now attributing some of that to the loss of Greenland and possibly also Antarctica. So why do we care? Well, obviously because these changes in temperature um, precipitation, melting sea ice, sea level rise are all causing societal impacts, such that the ideal range for crops, forests, and pests are shifting. Water is becoming difficult to plan for. The timing, the quantity, and the quality are less predictable. Extreme events are increasing. Our food supply is challenged by floods and droughts. Our forests are under siege from pests and fires. We see health effects ranging from the heat causing enhanced smog formation in cities to pe uh, pest drains that are shifting. We're also seeing um, more flooding from sea level rise and electric grid challenges where there is one uh, for air conditioning where there is air conditioning. So we are seeing less reliable materials and goods and services being supplied in the supply chain around the globe as we see this climate disruption. Um, forest pests that used to be killed by cold winters can now thrive year long and we see massive swaths of trees dead in Alaska and California and Colorado and in Canada. And of course that sets up a huge potential for fires. And in the western United States, big wildfires, so those that are more than 1,000 acres, which used to number 140 in the 1980s, have now jumped to 250. But 2017 was a bumper year, costing the U.S. Forest Service more than half of its budget to control. And you see on the bottom that the fire season has increased from five months to seven months, so about 200 days a year. And some are estimating that the fire season will increase to more than 300 days a year. 
So the cost of 2017 fire is still being calculated, but it could be as much as 180 billion. And some parts of the world are already exceeding the safe level for work activity outside. The orange and red places are where in the summer months it is dangerous. So we are actually reaching physiological limits for people and animals to be outside for any length. For example, the heat wave in 2015 in both Pakistan and then the one in India have been determined to be eight times more likely in today's climate changed world than previously. We are seeing terrible droughts. Here I'm showing you the, the Amazon where tremendous rainforests are. It's an amazing store of both carbon and biodiversity. And ecologists are worried that a huge die-off could lead to a huge pulse of carbon into the atmosphere instead of it serving as a very important sink. And of course that would greatly exacerbate climate change. And the food system is very complex and it's shaped by many interrelated factors that are all influenced by climate change. And so these are the trends by region from 1965 to 2015. And you see above zero, there are surplus years generally only in North and South America, Australia, and sometimes Eastern Europe. But there are deficits everywhere else, the red part, the below zero part, particularly in Africa and Asia. So when there are floods or fires or droughts, it reverberates throughout the world and causes famine as well as affects industry dependent on a steady supply of agricultural output in particular reason, regions. Um, this is Cape Town, South Africa today. Agriculture land on the left and a dam at 24% capacity on the right. Cape Town may completely run out of water in April, ironically, on Earth Day. We are also seeing epic rainfall events just this week in Paris and flooding from snowmelt and rainfall uh, leading to giant mudslides in the UK. The US, of course, has had its share. Three 500-year floods in Houston in recent years, 50 inches of rain in Harvey. These are photos of Baton Rouge, Louisiana before and after it got 20 inches of rain. So clearly we need to redefine the 100 year flood in our new climate and prepare for it. We are also seeing more powerful tropical storms. And these are just the record setters defined as strongest and largest. So hurricanes Irma, Maria, and Harvey didn't set records for being the longest or strongest, but Harvey's rainfall was a record at 50 inches, and Irma set a record as the longest Category 5 hurricane ever. Warmer ocean water fuels hurricanes, and as NASA says, tropical storms are like dry, giant engines that use warm, moist air as fuel. So since the 1990s alone, sea surface temperatures have increased about one degree Fahrenheit. Worldwide, extreme weather-related catastrophes have been increasing since 1980. So here the gold is storms, the blue are floods, and the red are temperature drought fire. The total number essentially tripled from 1980 to today. So they were numbering about 200 events in the early year, and this is data from Munich Ray. Um, and now they're about 600 a year. Losses from worldwide natural catastrophes in 2016 were 175 billion and only 50 of those billion were insured. But 2017 was a bumper year. And here are US losses in 2017 alone stacking up at $200 billion. So globally, this could stack up as the costliest year on record. They're still tallying the numbers. But estimates are the cost is $320 billion with about $133 of billion insured. This shows how those 2017 weather events played out regionally. Basically, I just want you to see that no continent escaped disaster. And as we look over the last 20 years, we see that storms, <laughs> the giant great causing 40% of the deaths. But floods, the blue, and droughts, yellow, end up affecting the most people. So in total, 82% of the population that are affected are because of floods or droughts. 
And we certainly know that there's a lot of infrastructure in the path of storm surges from rising sea level. This risky business report brought this home after Superstorm super Sandy's wake-up call. And higher sea level and storm surge will increase the annual cost of coastal storms along the U.S. eastern seaboard and the Gulf. Uh, and by 2100, that could be as much as 200 to 500 billion dollars. Major cities have a lot of infrastructure and people. And here are the top 10 by assets at risk. We are sitting in the third riskiest one right now. But there are at least 136 port cities worldwide vulnerable to sea level rise. And as I said at the beginning, science is beginning to advance its confidence in both the link between climate change and some of the extreme events. And we are beginning to tease out the attribution portion of climate change. So we have the strongest evidence on the things on the right, heat wave, coastal flooding, and extreme precipitation. And why is this? This is because some of these events are so outside the historic norm, they're essentially unprecedented and can't be explained without climate change. So you all know uh, what a bell curve is, and in a normal year, you'd expect a third of the temperatures to be below normal, a third to be normal, and a third to be above normal. But that simulation started in 1950, and you could especially see that extreme heat shifted dramatically in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. So if you look at the tails of that distribution, the three, four, five sigma events, extremely warm summers that were a tenth of the northern hemisphere now cover 10%. Or another way to think of it is the events that were five standard deviations or one in a million events are suddenly becoming far more common. The scientists have put out five volumes that have analyzed extreme weather and linkages to climate change. And in the most recent one that was just released in December, climate change was found to be a significant driver in 21 of 27 weather events studied. Or in other words, climate change made those events more likely. And in three events, they determined they were so far outside the range of natural variability, so far on the right of that bell curve I just showed you, that these events could never have occurred at all if man-made greenhouse gases were not causing climate change. I think probably you're used to scientists saying, we cannot attribute any single event to climate change. But the science has advanced to the point where this is no longer true, and this is a statement from the U.S. National Academies of Science saying it is no longer an unqualified blanket statement that we cannot link events to climate change. So I think really the first one is the reanalysis of the terrible European heat wave in 2003. And that suggests that climate change doubled the chance that that heat wave would happen. But as we look to the future, that heat wave, of, heat wave of 2003 will become the normal in Europe by 2040, and it'll be considered a cool summer by the end of the century. Another example of attribution is the Gulf Coast of US extreme rainfall events in August. So climate change increased the odds of that happening by 40% or making the return rate something you'd expect every 30 years instead of every 50 years, and the total intense rainfall increase by 10%. You know, those pictures are still, I think, very much seared in many of our brains. And being able to say that climate change made that event 40% more likely is quite powerful. So at the one degree Celsius increase we've already seen today, we have incredible cost and suffering. And increasingly, this is clearly affecting supply chains and the bottom line. As production, packing, transport, processing, and sales often occur in different places, they're dependent on smooth logistics, not disrupted by droughts, by floods, by typhoons, by fire. And this chart shows extreme precipitation risk for 68,000 corporate sites belonging to France's benchmark index, the CAC40, the 40 largest public companies in France. And it screens each corporate site for exposure and sensitivity. And the red and orange facilities have the highest exposure to extreme precipitation and flooding. 
So we have evidence that climate change is influencing the likelihood and the intensity of extreme events. But scientists also worry that there may be tipping points that could be traversed if action to stem climate change is not very fast and very efficient. And these include possible forest dieback in our boreal northern forests or in the Amazon, the monsoon shifting, uh, irreversible melting of Greenland and West Antarctica, and shifts in ocean circulation, as you see on this chart. Well, some of those tipping points are essentially irreversible, such as if a rainforest shifts to savanna to desert, or the die-off of coral reefs, as we are seeing now in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. There is a difference between stopping at a two-degree world that Paris agreed to or the one and a half degree aspirational world. And this graphic just shows that on the left, the one and a half degree world would lessen heat waves, water stress, flooding, and crop failure, and sea level rise, and coral bleaching. It is absolutely preferable to a two degree world, but it is still not a picnic. So let's turn and look at how big the task is. Can we avoid tipping points? This is now the temperature line of the Earth for 20,000 years. That's after we popped out of the Ice Age. So let's say the Paris Agreement works. Everyone ramps up ambition as we agreed to, and we manage to stop at two degrees. Well, here are some of the tipping points we might still trigger. WAIS, West Antarctic Ice Sheet, Greenland, Arctic sea ice, glaciers, corals. But the next tier, that start around four degrees, that roasted world from the first slide would likely be averted. And as you know, Paris is just the beginning and goes out only a few years. It'll take us to the red dot. But the action is in increased ambition that we expect every five years. If we continue the Paris ambition, the top of the green arrow, we will not have emissions fall to zero at the end of the century or stop at two degrees, shown as the bottom of the green arrow. But there is great momentum to make this happen. There's the drumbeat of science, for sure. There's the fact that climate impacts are being felt and are expensive. There's attribution of climate impacts on extreme events. New voices are calling for action. The costs of renewables are dropping. Cities, states, and countries are taking action. Businesses are responding and taking climate risks seriously. The investment community is activated. City and campus initiatives, all countries of the world participating in Paris and all but one country alleging they are officially still in. Um, recent reports by the Carbon Disclosure Project report that big companies are pushing their suppliers to report on climate risk. So there's more than 4,000 suppliers in this slide. And this is progress. If you look at the fourth bar, if 52% are really trying to incorporate climate risk into their business strategy, that is great news. However, other surveys suggest that using climate models as part of a long-term planning mechanism and or thinking about adaptation options is not common yet, so there is more work to do. But now to end, instead of those inexorable curves in, and of greenhouse gas emissions and temperatures, let's look at some great curves that are climbing or dropping and can help sol solve the problem. By 2030, new renewable energy capacity in green is projected to exceed new fossil capacity by more than four times. And at the top, I can add on a little bit there of nuclear. Uh, renewables are making impressive gains and expected to be 60% of global power capacity in the next five years, growth in the next five years. Uh, and this graph shows the growth of wind capacity since 1980, a good upward curve. There's been an amazing decline in the cost of crystal and silicon solar cells from $70 to 41 cents. Um, we are still in 2,500 liters from American city hall, state houses, boardrooms, college campuses, faith groups, spanning all 50 states and more than 130 million Americans and $6 trillion. And I'm very proud that both of my universities, Michigan and Maryland, are signers. And the America Pledge Initiative, launched by the former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg and California Governor Jerry Brown, which will aggregate and quantify the actions of state, city, businesses, and other non-national actors to drive down greenhouse gas emissions. 
Of course, there's the global covenant of mayors, more than 7,000 cities, 8% of the world's population, 50 countries vowing to be 100% renewable by 2050, 123 companies committed to 100% renewable energy. And I just want to stop, stop with the picture of climate finance. And, and this is the picture I most often see. The traditional way is to see the gap in public finance. And this is how the negotiators are, are still viewing the problem. But I think it misses the point in this room that you know. Governments are not the only collectors of revenue, far from it. And reconceptualized, the climate finance gap does not seem insurmountable but it does require serious engagement with new actors, and you are making this reconceptualization real. So it's gonna be a rough ride, but I think the investment community can really steer and accelerate the journey to that two degree non-roasted world, and not a moment too soon. Thank you.